Take your Bible and look to Isaiah. I hope to read the whole chapter, Isaiah chapter 30. Um, I hope to um, strengthen your biblical worldview as we read here. A few things to remember as we look at Isaiah. It's always important to remember uh, when he lived. Uh, it says Isaiah ministered in and around Jerusalem, and that's important. That's the southern kingdom. As a prophet to Judah for 53 years, it's a long time, isn't it? During the reigns of four kings, that would be from 739 B.C. to 686 B.C. That's important to remember because when the northern kingdom fell, he was all in the middle of it, you know, all that was going on. Um, 739 uh, the Northern Kingdom fell in 722. And when he began in 739, he'd been a young fella. That would have been 153 years before Jerusalem fell. Remember, he was in and around Jerusalem. So as he was there in and around Jerusalem, and he was a prophet, and he would, you read Isaiah, you can also read about him over in the book of Kings, I, I believe it would be Second Kings about that time. But anyway, whether it's First or Second Kings, I don't remember. But uh, he's mentioned over there as well. Uh, so when he died and ended his work, prophet, he would have been old, you know, in 686 B.C. That was a hundred years before Jerusalem fell. And these things are important to remember because what does that tell us? You know, a thousand years to God is like a day to us. And when he says something, even though it may be two, three hundred years before it happens, it's just as real two or three hundred years later as it was when he said it. It's going to be. It's going to happen. And that is the biblical perspective on things. And what's so interesting about that is that there's many, 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 many things that he has said are going to happen that still haven't happened yet. And so that puts us in the same position as these people that we read about in here, and we're about to read about them, and the faith or lack of faith that they had. You know, they, they, they were thinking, that's not going to happen. You're ridiculous. I don't have to listen to that. And we see that 153 years later, or 200 years, or three or 400 years later, sure enough, it happened. Well, it's the same for us. We're supposed to have faith in what was said, just like we read about them, and we see they should have had faith. Right? So we should have faith today. Um, It's important to read in Isaiah as we read this in chapter 30. It's important to read it in view of chapter 36 where Hezekiah prays in 701 B.C. And the angel of the Lord comes and kills that 186,000 strong army that was... Uh, surrounding Jerusalem. Uh, the way it was going, the northern kingdom had fallen in 722 B.C. So 701 B.C., the Assyrians were really, really strong. And they were campaigning. You know, they were going taking these people over. And uh, they would relocate them and make them work and pay their taxes to them. And, you know, they were an empire, the Assyrian Empire. And so they were headed down to Jerusalem. They were going to take Jerusalem, right? 701 B.C. 
And so when you get over here to chapter 36 uh, and read about what happened, uh, just let me, uh, chapter 36, verse 1, it came to pass in the 14th year of Hezekiah. So if he, if he reigned from 739 to 680, excuse me, 715, he reigned from 715 to 686. So in the 14th year, that would be 701. So in 701 B.C. is when uh, this takes place here in chapter 36. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem to the king Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Now, Reb Shaka made a terrible mistake. He mocked God. And Hezekiah goes, basically, and takes the letter that he sent, spreads it out, basically. He says, look, God, what he said. You know, of course, Hezekiah, they don't have hope. They've been so sinful. We're going to read about that in chapter 30. They've been so sinful and so wrong that God's been bringing this judgment on them. But when Hezekiah prays, it says in chapter 37, 35, and 36, uh, God says, I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, David lived in a, he lived in a thousand B.C. So you've got several hundred years, you know. 701, you got about 300 years, you know, when David was alive. But God says, I'm going to save it for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote the camp of the Assyrians, a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So you had 185,000 dead soldiers all around Jerusalem. Right? And so it was another 136 years after that before Jerusalem falls, because God says, I'm going to judge Jerusalem because of the sin. Covered up with homosexuality. Covered up with just stealing and lying. Just like our government today. Just like our country today. And so they, uh, they did receive that judgment. But there was repentance by that king. And he prayed. And so as we read this in chapter 30. Bear in mind that sometime after this. Probably not very far. Not very long. Uh. Assyria is going to come and besiege Jerusalem to take it, 701 B.C. Hezekiah does his prayer. God kills the army. And Reb Shekha and all of them, you know, they go back with their tail between their legs because God does what he does. But I wanted to read this because there is a statement in here that really caught my attention Monday. I was reading through this Monday. And so I jotted it down. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, I'll just do a devotion on that because it's so interesting to me. So let's read here in chapter 30, beginning in verse 1, and I'll just read through 15 verses. Uh, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, cover with a, a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. What does that mean? Adding sin to sin means it's progressive, isn't it? It gets worse and worse and worse. That walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zoan and his ambassadors came to Hanes, Hanes, they were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be a help, nor profit, but a shame and also a reproach. The burden of the beast of the south in, into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and the old lion, the viper and the fiery serpent, uh, the fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their tr uh, treasures upon the uh, bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. For the Egyptians shall help in vain, 
and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces he shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a sure to take fire from the hearth or to take water with all out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength and you would not. There in uh, verse 4, that Zoan and Hanes, those are uh, the cities in Egypt where the ambassadors of Israel were sent excuse me, of Jerusalem. They were sent there to try to get help from Egypt because of the Assyrian army that they knew was going to come. They knew the Assyrians were going to come. They had already taken the northern kingdom, right, 722. So here we are 20 years later, roughly. And they knew that the Assyrians were going around scarfing up everybody. And they were going to come to Jerusalem. So what do they do? They send an ambassador ambassadors up to Egypt, or down to Egypt, to try to get Pharaoh to help them. Send your army and help us, and we'll serve you, you know, and we won't have to be taken away by the Assyrians. So that's what that Zoan and Hanes are, cities where the ambassadors met with the Egyptians. And then verse 5, it says, they were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them. So what does that say? The, uh, the Egyptians were looking and said, Look, why should we help you? We're not... Y'all can't do anything that we need, right? When Judah's ambassadors went into Egypt to meet the princes and form an alliance, they found them either unwilling to help or unable to give them aid. The effort proved to be one of shame, confusion, and reproach on them for even seeking such assistance rather than asking for the help of Jehovah. Verse 5. You see, God is the one that had always helped when they had the conquest and they came into the land of you know, Canaan and they took that land and it became their country. God is the one that had helped them. You remember the giants? All that was going on there. It's just amazing what God had done. Uh, verse 6, it says, The burden of the beast of the south into the land of trouble and anguish from whence come the young and the old lion, the vi viper and the fiery flying serpent, they will carry their riches upon the shoulders of the young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to the people that shall not profit them. It says in my study Bible, the oracle of judgment on the caravan of Judah taking presents into Egypt to seek the help of the Egyptians against the Babylonians, uh, which would be Babylonians later on, we know, but the Assyrians. Uh, also, it expresses the idea that the messengers of Judah would face the dangers of lions and vipers and serpents trying to get help from Egypt, but they would not take one step toward God to seek his help. They would carry riches to Egypt to pay for help instead of asking God who would give it without price. They would get no profit from Egypt, but God himself would be their profit if they would only turn to him. And so, uh, what does this tell a nation, right? What does this tell any nation? If we will place our faith and our hope and our trust in God and be a godly nation and live righteous lives and have righteous laws, you know, God will help that nation. It's just why it's how we got here. You know, that's why our nation has always been as blessed as we are. And so these are the lessons that we 
uh, understand from God's word is that righteousness, that's simply right living, righteousness is what God blesses. You know, you have families, you have families taking care of one another, you have families loving one another, and all of that family stuff, which is biblical, uh, it produces an atmosphere where you're strong. You know, we will fight for our country, right? Because we love our country, because we love our families, and we love our homes. And all of it works together. And so uh, as you see the breakup of the family, right? You see all of this ungodly living, right? Like we have. All these families breaking up, right? Like we have. Then you see all of these people, well, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not about to go to war and die for this country, right? You know, and That's the attitude that you end up having. And then it all begins to weaken. And it all begins to crumble. And then before long, you know, it falls. Uh, but anyway, we have here in verses 8 through 11, uh, God, it talks about the rebellion against God, which is rebellion against righteousness. It's rebellion against God's ways, against God's laws. So verses 8 through 11, go write it before them in a table, note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, right? God, I don't want to hear what, you're, what you say is right. I want to go have some fun, right? I want to live life the way I want to live life. Married? Who needs to get married? Right? Watch what, uh, which say to the seers, what is a seer? It's a prophet, a person that sees visions, a seer. And they say to the seers, don't look and tell me what you see. I don't want to hear what you say you're seeing from God. Right? And to the prophets, prophesy not to us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Get God out of here. All right? And what's our country done? All this is exactly what our country's done. All right? And in this first 12 here, uh, you know, as I mentioned, these things speak to all countries because it's the same God. He watches all countries as they unfold. The righteous ones, he blesses. The sinful ones, there's turmoil, there's, uh, there's law-breaking, there's covetousness, all this stuff that goes on that's ungodly, that takes place. Um, Jeremiah chapter 22 verse 29 you know he's a prophet and as I stand before you and I read the, prophet, the, the prophecy and that's what I'm doing I'm reading to you a prophecy um, Jeremiah said oh earth, earth, earth hear the word of the Lord and that's so true today I would stand before the microphone on the television where all the world could hear me and I would say that, earth, 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 y'all hear the word of the Lord. Because that's our answer. You know, our answer is God's word. But uh, verse 12 is what spoke to me. Notice what it says there in verse 12. It's what caught me on this whole chapter. It says, wherefore, or you can say therefore, since all this rebellion, right? Therefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word, and trust in oppression. Right? You trust in oppression. You prefer oppression. How do you trust in oppression? How do you do that? You are placing your faith in people that will oppress you. You're listening to their lies. 
and believing what they say to you is going to be better for you. Right? Um, if we will refuse ourselves of blessings, if we will do without, if we will limit our freedom, Depend upon someone else. Everything will be all right. Is there anybody giving us that pitch today? <laughs> God's word is so true. If you will just turn your life over to us. And do what we tell you to do. Put that mask on. Right? Huh? Take that vaccine. Submit to what we tell you to do, regardless. Everything will be just fine. As long as you just do what I tell you to do. It's the same God. It's the same devil. It's the same thing in 701 B.C as it is in 2022 AD. Same thing. Anyone that would trust in oppression would have to be deceived. Right? Do you want to be oppressed? No. Oppression is not what we want. I don't want to live an oppressed life. I want freedom. Anyone that would trust in oppression would have to be lied to by the oppressor. It has to be. If the oppressor told you what his plan was, that was to put his thumb on him, right? Where he could hold you right where he wanted you and keep you from spending money, right? We got to save the earth. You're going to have to cut back. I'm not cutting back, but I'm going to get you to cut back for the good of everybody, right? But I'm going to be in charge. You listen to me. Y'all pay these higher gas prices because y'all need to be cutting back. Right? Well, we got plenty of gas, but I don't want you. I don't want you to have it. Right? Right? Anyone that would trust in oppression would have to be lied to by the oppressor. The oppressor would have to snooker the oppressed. It'd have to. Who would choose? To be oppressed on purpose. And God is saying here, you're trusting in oppression to see you through your problems. <laughs> right? The oppressor would have to overpower the oppressed. He would have to be evil. The oppressor would have to be an evil person. Has to be. And he's lying to you saying, I'm doing what's good for you. You just need to get on board. All, all of that. And, and, and it'll work itself out, you know, over time, if it's good, right? The oppressor would have to be greedy. It'd have to be. The oppressor would have to be a liar. It'd have to be. Because nobody would choose to be oppressed unless you lied to them. The oppressor would have to hunger and crave for power and get power any way they could. He says, because you despise this word and trust in oppression, right? And it says, and perverseness. You trust in oppression and perverseness, right? So because you despise this word and trust in oppressors, because you despise this word and trust in liars and power-hungry people and greedy people, and you despise this word and trust in evil people, and perverseness. I'm going to bring this judgment on him. That's what he's saying. And we see the same thing in our country today. When, when you look at what's happening and what's going on. Things that are going on that are so perverted today. So twisted today. I can't keep my mouth shut about it. 
you know, like they want me to, and you know, I've been taken off of Facebook. You know, they want me, and they, they want to cite, but but it's so perverted. It's got to be pointed out, you know, from pulpit. It just does. Um, here's some stuff I pulled out of a previous uh, devotion I had done about communism. Because uh, this is what this is, is communism. Communism is what is trying to overtake this country. Trusting in communism is the same as trusting in oppression. Same thing. And when, when, the, when God's word here says, uh, because you despise this word and you trust in oppression and perverseness. Uh, verse 13, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out of a high wall whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. So, you know, when, when, when the judgment comes, it's real quick. You know, it's like, how did it, well, it was real, real, real slow, and all of a sudden, one day, it happened real fast. <laughs> and that's the way it, that judgment comes. But uh, think about uh, communism and what it is and how, how it works. It plays off of people's greed. You know, it's what it does. Uh, think of the logic of antich antichristism. Antichrist. What is Antichrist? We know he's going to be the ruler in those last days. Uh, and how people will trust in him and he will actually try to be God. So Antichristism, you might say. Uh, that's one way of putting it. Progressed ungodly men. There's no faith in communism. You know, put your faith and hope in the government what basically it is. Don't have faith in God. Have faith in government. And listen to what government says and do what government says. And go where government says you can go. Own what the government says you can own. All right, that's oppression. Okay? It's contrary to faith. Man's effort at managing without God. Think about that. That's a good statement. Man's effort at managing without God. Communism. Man's effort at managing without the hope of a Savior. Communism. We don't need God. We don't need a Savior. We got this thing all mapped out. Right? Um, man's effort at managing without fear of judgment. Exist only by division, disunity, disagreement, discord, greed, selfishness. It's contrary to liberty, justice for all, indivisible, oneness, individuality, self-sufficiency, and family pride. It is contrary to those things. It's all about uh, the village, right? It takes a village. And I'll read this and we'll quit because it's almost 8 o'clock. But this is the beginning document of communism. It is not the Communist Manifesto. It is the Manifesto of the Communist Party, if you want to look it up. I, I've read this before, and I want to get it on Facebook. That's why I'm reading it again. But it is the, it is the ground floor, the beginnings, the very beginning teachings of communism. And what the goal is, and it is a worldwide movement. It seeks to uh, it seeks to conquer the world, one world communist government is what the goal is. And so uh, here it is: uh, proletariat is is labor. Uh, think about organized labor. The proletariat, the worker, is is the proletariat. Uh, we have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat, the worker, to the position of ruling class to win the battle of democracy. Right? So they're going to really push the unions because that's what the, 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 the working 
organized labor is the ground floor of communism. They push that. That's where it all came from. Organized labor came from communism. All right? We need to understand that. The proletariat, the worker, will use its political supremacy to wrest, by degree, all capital from the... Uh, I can't pronounce the word, but for lack of a better word, I would say from the, the ownership class. The, the wealthy, in their eyes. Okay? The ownership class. Uh, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, that is, of the proletariat, the work, the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible. In the beginning, this cannot be effected, ex effected except by means of despotic inroads on the rights of property and on the conditions of the The ownerships, the management's production, the burjoys, I can't pronounce the word. By means of measures, therefore, which appear economically insufficient and unattainable, but which in the course of the movement outs outstrip themselves, necessitate further inroads upon the old social order and are unavoidable as means of entirely revolutionizing the mode of production. These measures will, of course, be different in different countries. So you can see that the goal of communism is to take over all countries through organized labor that basically fight the management, take them to court, file grievances, you know, all the work that the union does to bring down the uh, system that's in place but uh, in most advanced countries, the following will be pretty generally applicable. The abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. So you can't own land. Everything belongs to the state. Right? A heavy progressive or graduated income tax it means everybody gets the same amount of money. If you make a lot of money, the government just takes more of it. Abolition of all rights of inheritance. You can't inherit anything. Confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and the exclusive monopoly. We control all the money. Centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. You can't go anywhere but where we say you can go. Extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state. The state owns all the businesses. In other words, everybody works for the state. Just like going over here and getting a job at, on the state highway department. Except all businesses are now owned by the state. Everybody gets their paycheck from the state. The state controls it all. You can't start your own business. That's the final goal. No entrepreneurs. You just do what the state says to do. And we'll pay you, you know, the amount that, that's fair and equal to everybody. Right? Uh, equal liability of all to work. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries. Gradual abolition of all the distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of the populace over the country. So you got to move where they say. Free education for all children in public schools. Abolition of children's factory labor in its present form. Combination of education with industrial production. Etc. We'll stop right there. Uh, I had a good bit more I wanted to do. Uh, but what, what we see today in our day with what's taking place with what I read to you 
is a, it's one of the final efforts of mankind to run this planet without God. Because when you look at what God has for you, freedom, liberty, blessings, a good life, versus what man-made government wants you to have, which is oppression, right? It fits exactly what God's punishment is. I'm just going to let you do what you think is right in your own eyes, which is ungodly living, and I'm going to let it run its course. And we're seeing that, you know, Biden is all for GM's electric cars and Ford and Chrysler, but won't even talk to Tesla. And Tesla is one of the strongest uh, electric car makers there is. And they're in the United States. But they're not union. Right? And so it even plays out, you know, in, in what, what the devotion's about tonight. Biden's a communist. He's going to support the, the unionized, the communist uh, companies that have labor unions. And Tesla, they don't have labor unions. So, you know, he's not going to, he's not going to support them. He encourages that. You know. But it's right there in the news when you understand what's going on. Right? And so it's trusting in oppression. That's what trusting in oppression is. All right, it's five after. We got to start hauling youngins, right? But uh, that was so blatant. <laughs> I had to do a devotion on it. <laughs> I just had to had to bring that out, you know, because we're living in the last days, you know, and we just need to accept that and understand it and try to reach as many people for Christ as we can. Uh, because it's so uh, it's so real and obvious. Any comment before we go? Trying to get all of the large, trying to get everybody organized with organized labor. So basically the government can be in control of it. That's what it amounts to. The only thing I see about it is the wrong electric cars. I don't know how long it takes to charge them back up. Because you're going to say you've got a 500 mile manual battery. You might sit there for an hour or so. Before you can take off the engine. Yeah. So you put up the fuel pump in about yeah. five minutes and done. Right, yeah. yeah. They don't have it perfected yet, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's stand up and have prayer and be dismissed. I'm going to run us over tonight. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word and what it means to us. Thank you for uh, speaking to our hearts. And we pray, Father, that we might take these truths that uh, you speak to our hearts about and realize the importance of uh, serving you and, and living according to your word. Uh, be with us, we pray, as our God, as we go.